Hello everyone, welcome to the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup. My name is Travis Atkinson and I work for TBD Solutions. Uh, chances are I have talked to you on the phone and um, it's great to have you joining us. If this is your first uh, time joining one of our workgroup calls and you're wondering what is this about, um, we are a consortium of uh, crisis uh, stabilization, crisis residential providers across the country uh, developing a best practices toolkit for this level of care. So for the past 11 months, we have been having conversations around uh, the components of crisis uh, stabilization or crisis residential services and trying to uh, identify what those best practices are. So we can put those together in a electronic toolkit which will be available uh, sometime early next year. So thanks everyone for joining us. Um, if you don't have the ability to see our slides and you're just calling in, uh, you can download them from our, the website crisisresidentialnetwork.com. If you click on the best practices toolkit page, um, that will take you where you need to go uh, to find the slides. So for today's agenda, our program spotlight is RHD, which is based out of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, Michael Usino will be uh, uh, telling us about the, the crisis programs that they operate uh, in Pennsylvania as well as um, in some other states. Uh, we will be doing a review of our survey which was on managing admissions and the milieu and then we'll talk about those results, have some discussion, and then uh, review the project plan and the timeline. So. Uh, couple housekeeping items. Uh, TBD Solutions continues to support the Crisis Best Practices Workgroup. We are a research, training, and consulting group based in Michigan, providing services across the country. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter, at uh, TBD Solutions. We're also on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, more information about us can be found at tbdsolutions.com. Um, this is our updated, uh, th this is actually a, a different iteration of the crisis services map that we have been looking at uh, for the last uh, few months. So we have been collecting information on uh, crisis programs across the country, not just this, this uh, subacute level of care, um, but also uh, with uh, crisis, um, crisis call centers and mobile crisis teams. Um, a number of, uh, of different crisis uh, programs uh, with the intent to create a map and um, have locations and, and understanding of what services exist um, across the country. So I'm actually going to um, step out of the presentation here for a minute, not personally, I mean I'm going to uh, switch a window here and kind of show you uh, another iteration of this map that we've put together. So. In Michigan, we have been talking about uh, network adequacy recently and about what does it mean uh, to have an, an adequate number of psych hospital beds or crisis residential beds. So um, Josh, uh, who does a lot of our um, programming and data analytics, um, put together a map. So this is just crisis residential programs um, uh, across the country, so they're, they're, that's what the filter is. But what he did was he drew a 60 mile radius on every program. So for example, um, if we want to look at let's say Colorado, um, we can kind of see where most of the programs lie or what the 60 mile radius looks like. So this might give you an idea, like if, if you, let's, it's, it's unlikely that your state is equally populated all across the state, but if it was, um, then you might be able to take a look and say, okay, let's look at a state like North Carolina. Um, how well covered is the state uh, in, a, in catchment area for, for crisis services? Um, and it seems to look pretty good actually based on the information that we have. So again, this is an interactive map. Uh, we're, it's still in kind of a beta uh, testing phase and we hope to have that out um, uh, you know, maybe probably on our crisis residential website or on our, our company website uh, sometime soon. Uh, but it's important for us to think about, you know, what, how do 
how is our state covered with these services and, and how do we determine what is an adequate number of beds or services that are available. So this is just kind of another way um, to look at that. Okay, let's go back in. Okay, so the, um, the slides should be coming back up here. Okay, great. So, an update on our work group participants. So excited that this continues to grow. Uh, we have almost every week we've got a new provider reaching out to us. So if you've been reaching out to your state and um, you know asking for them to to um, to get in touch with the other providers, um, it's working, and we really appreciate that. We have over 160 participants now um, from 43 states. Um, we anticipate there's approximately 410 crisis homes across the country. Uh, we even have some uh, state behavioral health administrations that are participating from Minnesota and New York and Texas and Virginia and Washington and Wisconsin. So that's really great. Uh, we wanted to also welcome the new participants from Minnesota and Oklahoma and Massachusetts and Georgia. Um, in addition to that, we got to have kind of a mini uh, crisis uh, uh, meetup at a conference this past week in Buffalo, New York. So I think that I mentioned this a couple times on our, our phone calls, but uh, the National Crisis Conference, which focuses largely on crisis call centers, uh, had their annual conference last week. And uh, Mark from Texas and um, uh, Carrie from Ohio um, and a few other people that are on our call uh, were there. So we got to meet each other and that was really cool. It was great to put um, you know, faces with, uh, with names that have been participating um, in our work group. So it was great to see all of you there and that was, uh, that was a pretty cool thing. Okay, so I'm going to turn over the um, discussion now to um, Michael. Uh, Michael is the director of uh, crisis services for two crisis programs um, at Resources for Human Development. So, Michael, I'm going to let you take it away. Michael, are you ready to to um, uh, to do your slides? I'm wondering if maybe your computer is muted. I'm not sure because I see your um, your microphone on, but I'm not hearing anything. Okay. Tell you what, we are going to, once we get Michael in here, then we will um, uh, have him start his slides. But in the meantime, we'll start to review a few of um, the slides from uh, the results of our uh, survey for this month. So, um, for those of you that have been with us for the long haul since the beginning, uh, then you're familiar with all the topics that we've covered. Uh, but since our first call back in, um, Michael, are you there? <laughs> now, now it's Halloween time and maybe I'm hearing ghosts, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, for those of you that have been with us since the long haul, we have gone over a number of topics related to crisis services. Um, and this is a list of all the topics that we've covered. So the last few months we've talked about uh, regulations and governance back in August. We talked about clinical services and training uh, last, uh, last month. And this month we're gonna be talking about managing admissions and the, uh, the milieu. So, it's a big challenge for crisis programs like yours. If you haven't, uh, you probably knew that before um, you got on the call today, but hopefully some of our conversations have been validating for you uh, as we've talked about just some of these very unique challenges that your programs face that many other programs in the continuum uh, don't have to deal with. So uh, one of those challenges is the front door and kind of functioning as an access center and, and making decisions uh, about who, sh who should be able to come into your program and who's not appropriate. Um, but then there's also decisions uh, around the safety net and uh, you know what do you do for people when they don't have anywhere else to go and that's been a um, 
that's been a topic of conversation in some of our previous calls. But how do you, you know, how do you balance those things of, of, uh, you know, maintaining uh, the criteria, making sure that it's a safe place for the other clients that are receiving services, um, as well as your staff. Um, that can be a really hard balance to do, and um, I think it's it's important to keep in mind that while we've always got uh, some ideals right around what we want uh, the program to be like ultimately the program has to be helpful to your community that's that's you know of the utmost important if, if it's not relevant and it can't provide a meaningful service to your community um, then it's probably not going to be sustainable so and that that can come up in conversations about having you know, specialized crisis beds or, you know, making a lot of accommodations, changing some staffing models, changing, um, you know, whether or not you have nursing 24-7. Uh, some of those some of those things can come up. And, uh, and, and so that can be hard as a provider if you've been initially brought in to do one thing and then a year or two later they ask you to do something else, which might come with its own set of challenges. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit through um, managing the admissions and uh, the milieu. Um, Michael, is your microphone working yet? Okay. Okay, so here is um, the... Uh, okay, just got a message from Michael. It sounds like... Um, uh, He's having some audio issues, but um, we can invite him, which is what we'll do here in just a minute. This is what's fun about being adaptable, right? Working in crisis services and presenting on crisis services is that you just get to go with the flow. So we are going to talk about the following areas. This is These are all the areas that we um, ask people for feedback on in the survey. So how do you handle medical clearance? Um, like what does that mean exactly? You know, what are what are some of the components around it? Um, how do you um, handle complex medical needs? What do you do when someone um, you know has a comorbid medical condition, has a co-occurring SUD condition? Um, you know, those kinds of things. What about approving referrals? You know, how what what does that process look like? Is it is it long and drawn out? Is it simple? Is it you know, in the hands of the nurse or the clinician that's on staff. Um, you know, w what does that look like? And then exclusionary criteria. So what are the reasons that you would not allow someone into your program? And, uh, and who makes that decision? Um, so from there, um, we're also going to talk about the, uh, the legal system involvement. So. What do you do if someone uh, is on, uh, maybe there's a warrant out for their arrest? Um, what do you do when the police come to the front door? Um, this is something that's happened to a lot of programs. And what do you do around, uh, like, safety plans? So, um, the first question is about medical clearance, and it says, when is medical clearance necessary for referrals in your into your crisis program? And um, about half of the people said if there's a risk of alcohol withdrawal. And I should say, by the way, that we had great participation this month. We had over 30 uh, participants, um, so that was really great. Um, and that uh, anyway, so about 30% said there's a history of. If there's a history of comorbid medical issues, then they'll need medical clearance. Um, and then about 28% said all admissions. So you could add that 28 to any of the other uh, bars to say, you know, that's that's happening all the time. Um, some some areas where people mentioned were like recent overdose or poor vitals, um, untreated medical conditions, or if there's a communicable disease and medications haven't been started for that. Um, and then another person said drowsiness or confusion or cognitive impairment, a cardiac symptoms, an active pica diagnosis, or major organ dysfunction that could um, that could affect the, all, all those things could affect it. So, uh, Michael, I'm wondering if we have you on the phone now. Is your is your phone working? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Michael, we can hear you. Let's um I'm going to I'm going to go back to the start of your slides and give you a chance to talk about RHD. Are you there now, Michael? We heard you for a second, but now now I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, no problem. So yes, thank you. I'm sorry. I sound like that commercial from uh, AT and T or whatever it is. So. <laughs> oh, okay, so so thank you for the opportunity to to have a few seconds to speak with you folks about what we do here in Pennsylvania. So as Travis said, I, I work for a company called Resources for Human Development. Um, we are all over the place. So if you want to move move the slide to the next slide, that'd be fine. Um, so again, a brief history of our program. Uh, Multinational uh, uh, national company. We are pretty much all over the place, and uh, we do a lot of different things from and just about anything. So if somebody comes to us and says, "There's a group of folks that need this kind of services," we would try to see if we could meet that need. But we we really concentrate on housing, DNA, drug and alcohol um, crisis, and children's services, and we responded in Philadelphia. So uh, that's where our headquarters is, and that's why I was having so much trouble with our audio because by the time somebody comes from Philadelphia to here, uh, it'll be three weeks. So uh, that's, that's one of the challenges of being so far from the headquarters. Uh, next slide, please. So again, we are over. We are in 15 states. Uh, and in, in some states, it's just one program. It might be a housing uh, program. In other states, it could be you know, 10, 15 different programs that um, are serving uh, different populations. Uh, we're going to talk more about what we have in Pennsylvania and specifically on our crisis programs. But I'm sure just seeing from all the folks that are part of this group, we're probably neighbors somewhere along the way. So uh, feel free to drop into any of our programs in your state. Just tell them Mike sent you. See, see how, how far that gets you. <laughs> Next slide, please. So that's our mission. You know, we, we want to provide caring and effective and innovative services uh, to empower all people. So our, our core belief is that there is goodness in every individual. And if we work together and we give people the resources they need, they can lead successful lives to whatever that means to them uh, in their community. So, so we all believe that. We have a tagline that says, together we are better. Uh, and that's something that we try to embrace all the time, that uh, together we're better. Next slide, please. So again, our crisis programs, we have uh, two programs. This is Hope House. Uh, this program is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Uh, we serve two counties, uh, Northampton and, and uh, Lehigh counties. And we provide a bed uh, facility here. Uh, we're licensed by OMSAS, which is the Office of Substance Abuse and uh, Mental Health. And we also are uh, funded by uh, welfare and other providers. We've been around uh, for quite a bit, so uh, we're well known in the community. Uh, it's a beautiful facility. It's out in the middle of the woods, um, and people people just know. Know us to the point that we'll come up to the door and there's somebody there self-referring, which we don't do, but um, that's how well known we are. People just walk over and knock on our door and want to take a bed. Next slide, please. And then our other program is, is New Perspectives. That program is in Strasburg, which is considered the Poconos of Pennsylvania. Uh, we provide services up there as well. We have a crisis residence, uh, a bed by license, and um, we also do other services over there, which we'll get into a little bit more in the next slides. But uh, those are the two programs that we have in Pennsylvania for crisis. Go ahead, please. Uh, again, we, we are in Carver, Monroe, and Pike, behind Northampton County. So the Poconos is Carver, Monroe, and Pike. And up there is, is a large, large area. Uh, so we could go two hours from one location to the other to do a 302 or to do a crisis intervention. So up in the Poconos, our staff are constantly on the road uh, doing crisis interventions in any kind of weather. Uh, we're, we're probably better than the post office when it comes to delivering services. So. I'm very proud of that. Uh, we could go a little. Uh, next slide, please. So again, we are an eight bed uh, short term facility, and that's by licensure. We cannot add any more beds, and we cannot take away any beds. We have to have eight beds by our licensing uh, standards. 
And we are about a five to seven day stay uh, in that both program. So folks come in via referral. Um, we do all the clearances and all the things that we need to do, and they begin their, their, their crisis stay. Um, and then typically they're out of here within seven days. Some of the longer stays are 10. However, we have had people in our residence for up to three months. We had a, a young woman who was pregnant in the seventh month of pregnancy, was here for about two months, and she kind of left the building because she needed to go give birth. Uh, we also have folks with housing issues that might be here a little longer, and we collaborate with the insurance company and other providers to get them um, what they need, but that's usually the exception. Up in uh, Poconos, we provide mobile crisis interventions. We have a medical team, uh, and then we have um, a regular crisis team that provide interventions throughout all three counties. So we come out uh, and provide interventions right in someone's home, in the community. We can meet you at Walmart if you'd like to see And then uh, we also are the folks that facilitate all the petitions for involuntary commitment. So anytime somebody, in Pennsylvania we call them 302, so anytime someone calls for a 302, uh, our folks go out and complete that petition, uh, or we try to mitigate the situation and do a referral or keep that person from uh, being involuntary committed if they want to, uh, you know, go in, going on their own uh, and they want to voluntarily commit. And we also do crisis phones for those three counties. So we average about 1,200 crisis calls a month. Uh, we're 24-7, so our treatment really starts at the phone call. Uh, our trained folks uh, are there to provide interventions right on the phone, uh, try to get as much information to mitigate the situation or get involved, whether we're calling uh, 911, police. And then from there, we make referrals to either our mobile teams or to the house or to other providers. Uh, we do about 140 to 150 mobiles uh, a month. Probably about half of those are medical mobiles, those are folks with medication issues, running out, not having enough, uh, not being able to take them, um, having issues with medications. And then uh, we don't count the 302s as part of the mobile. Uh, but we do about 70 to 80 uh, petitions for involuntary commitment a month, uh, which is a lot. Uh, so that's pretty much the services that we provide across the board. Uh, so next slide, please. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we really like and what we're proud of, so every one of our programs, we, we began to work on what we are calling, you know, trauma-informed care. Um, we, we really focus on, on, on making sure that our language, our, the way we do things is recovery-focused and trauma-focused. So the folks that come to our program, they're called guests. Uh, we don't have consumers. We don't have, we have guests there. There are guests. Uh, we use a lot of language that is, uh, you know, recovery focused. So we don't say someone, and I'm sure we all do, but I'm saying we don't. In our documentation, no one refused something. They opted to or they chose not to, but we try to use that kind of language. And, and to make sure that everybody's stuck in the same language, we had our staff train in seeking safety, which is an evidence-based trauma-informed care model of care. We also had all our staff train in TREM which is Trauma Recovery and Empowerment Model. And we also train them in VTRAM, which is for veterans. So all our staff is, is trained to work with folks uh, that are, were in the military, are now veterans, uh, and we use that model to work with those folks. We also uh, created a crisis resolution plan, which it would be considered a treatment plan. So every guest that comes into our residence on, from the minute they walk in, or maybe even our referral process, we begin to work on a, on a treatment plan. So what got you here? How are we going to get you out of here in seven to ten days? How are we going to resolve your issue? Who needs to get involved? And that plan is reviewed three times a day. We, see, we sit with the guests, uh, first shift, second shift, and right before third shift uh, ends in the morning, every individual in the building gets involved in the treatment of our consumer or our guest. So that way he or she knows that, there's a continuum of care across our program. Everybody knows what you're going through. And then one good thing that we started to do that's working really well is within 72 hours of your admission, we're having a discharge meeting. So if you have an ACT team or an ICM worker or anybody, family, anybody working with you that has a potential impact on your successful discharge from our program, 
we have a meeting and we and we facilitate those at our facility or via phone or however, but we are expecting people to participate. And that's been really successful and that's really maintained the, the discharge process to make it smooth, make sure that the guest is getting what he or she needs and that we're holding each other accountable to what is it that our roles are uh, and then being able to clear those crisis beds for the next person. So that's, that's something that's working. Uh, some trainings that we've done, we, every one of our staff has been training sign language and we try as much as possible to, to, to use it and work with each other and we have things around the building to remind folks. We have placemats with the sign language uh, alphabet. alphabet. Um, we have, uh, we, we, we will do meetings where we try to do the meeting beginning with sign language. So we really want folks, because we have had experiences here where folks are coming in and they, and they, are, they need those services. So we're trying to do that here as well. All our staff are trained in de-escalation techniques, uh, DDT, CDT. We are also training our folks in mindfulness and, and, and we work with our, with our guests on doing mindfulness. So that's a lot of the things that we're doing uh, outside of the fact that we have to work on the crisis resolution of the individual. Um, every one of our staff is, is either a bachelor's level or a master's level. Uh, that's based on our uh, regulations. The state requires that in our programs we have two types of staff members, a crisis worker or a mental health professional. And there's some very strict criteria for each of those. Um, to be a mental health professional in Pennsylvania in crisis, you have to have a master's degree and three years of experience, or a bachelor's degree, five years of experience, two of those years have to be supervisory. Anybody else who doesn't meet that criteria is a crisis worker. It's a wonderful idea. It makes it very difficult to hire people and keep people based on you know, economies of scale and what we can pay folks. Uh, and they also require that there's two people in the building at all time, regardless of census. And one of those has to be an MHP. So even if we have one guest in the house, we have to have two people in every shift. Again, it makes it difficult for budgetary uh, functions, but it works for our guests and it's a good model for, for safety. But uh, those are some of the challenges that we have uh, in our program. But everybody here... Um, is committed to working with our, with our guests. We do a lot of external trainings. We try to find new and innovative ways of, of working with folks. We have a cooking club or a cooking group every Sunday that individuals just, just pick recipes. We buy the ingredients. We cook together. Everybody participates. We have arts and crafts groups. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is uh, when you come in, we give you a craft that you choose out of a number that we have and you work on that craft while you're here. So you start with nothing, you build through that craft so you have a finished product that may be a work of art in your eyes just like every individual is a work of art. So we wanted to take ownership of the treatment and empower them to take care of that craft and finish it and take it with them and remind them about that growth movement. And that's something else that we're really proud of that works really well with our guests. So uh, that's, that's pretty much it. I'm sorry I talked so fast. Uh, is the Latino in me, so pardon that. <laughs> but um, this, is what, this is what we do over here. Uh, again, very proud of it. Uh, this is our programs. We're happy to be part of this group and be learning from others. But, um, so any questions, any, any comments, um, no, let me know. Uh, oh, again, I'm sorry. We, we also do a lot of staff recognition here. Uh, we have an employee of the month every month for every one of our programs uh, rec and staff recognizes that person. There's a nomination process. Each individual who wins the employee of the month gets a certificate and a $25 gift card of their choice. Um, we also have uh, our, our corporate values. We have 12 corporate values uh, that each employee and every from management to employees we, we follow. And, um, and you can see them on the side there. And then we have a great relationship in the community. We, we're involved in our communities. We participate in, in all kinds of walks. We are part of all kinds of different groups. We encourage our, our, our staff members to volunteer in other community venues. We have folks who volunteer at Target with their food drives. We have folks who volunteer at a garden. Uh, so we really want our folks to get involved and we, because 
we want them to be to be. I, I always say I want them to be a bunch of Navy SEALs. I want these people to be the best they can be, feel that they make a difference, that they matter, and that they're the best equipped, best trained, you know, crisis workers out there. And that starts with recognizing them and making sure that they have a, a safe and productive working environment. So next slide, please. All right, there we go. Any, any questions, comments? Thank uh, you. Know, you should. You can always email me, but otherwise I'm here. Um, Michael, I want to just start off and say that, like, I am on fire right now. Like, I am so excited. That was awesome. I loved all the examples of how you're both supporting your um, the, the people that you serve and, like, the language that you use and how you describe their behaviors and, like, not using the word refuse. Um to, to how you like just honor their humanity like through the cooking classes and the artwork um, and how you honor your employees too a, a lot of times um, uh, uh, organizations either get one of those right or they get the other right you know they either treat the employees really well or they treat the clients really well but it's sometimes it's rare that you do both and I'm just I'm blown away I love the I love the work that you guys are doing it sounds like you're like the mission and, and values of your organizations are, are are very much internalized in you and in, in your team. And uh, man, that's really, really cool. Um, I, I had a question, but now it's starting to escape me. I guess mine was just a procedural one. You said um, eight license for eight beds. Is that the most that you can have in a crisis program in your state, or does it just happen to be what your programs are licensed at? No, it's what you could have in the state. So our regulations specifically state you know more than eight beds. Okay, great. Um, does anyone else have questions that they want to ask Michael? If you're asking a question right now and you're wondering why you're not getting feedback, you might be muted. So make sure to hit star six before you start talking if you're um, calling through the phone. Well, also, folks, feel free to email or anything. And if we can share any of our documents and any other information, uh, you know, um, let, let us know. Hi, this is Char with Robert Brown in Michigan. Hello, Michigan. I had a quest quick question. Yes, please. We, I wanted to get a little bit more in depth. It was harder to hear a little bit for you, but how do you work the cooking classes? Um, when it comes to them picking, you know, what they're cooking or how, with people that are on precaution checks. Can you go in depth yes. on that a little bit? Yes, of course. So, so yeah, so that starts, you know, we, we have a community meeting uh, on Wednesdays uh, where we begin to talk about what the weekend's going to look like. And we understand that in between there, there may be some, some new folks coming in, so then we meet with those folks individually. But between Wednesday and Thursday, we pick what they're going to cook. We kind of identify who our lead chef is going to be and who's going to get involved, and we kind of give roles to people using that criteria. So if we know somebody shouldn't be around knives, we're going to give you the piece where you're getting the cans from downstairs. Or, you know, we're not going to point out, point out that we can't hand you something pointy, but no pun intended, but we're going to, uh, to include you as best as we can. If for some reason that person could not be included in, in that particular task, so we will have a conversation with them, and we may offer them a separate uh, activity. But the idea is to have inclusion as much as possible. So the menus are simple. Uh, it could be a one or two, two in, you know, ingredient dish, some pasta, some things like that. But it's really about the coming together, the prep, and talking about those those ADLs, those living skills. Uh, but we always take into con safety is always the number one priority for for the cons for the guests and for the staff. So. If you cannot participate, we'll find a way to get you involved, but you may not be able to. So it starts, and like I said, it starts around Wednesday and Thursday, and then on Sunday we have all the all the supplies. I think the staff has been working on with one of our culinary uh, schools to get everybody aprons and get everybody chef's hats and just have them here uh, to make it more fun. But always knowing it's still a treatment facility. We're still dealing with folks with behavioral and mental health issues. 
and that always is in the forefront of everything that we do, safety. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Anyone else with questions? Something I forgot to mention too, so just so everybody knows, that, especially the safety piece, uh, every one of our staff members has a safety plan that they carry in the back of their ID cards. So we get together with each staff member at the beginning of the year and we come up with what their safety plan is going to look like. So when you're stressed out, when you're get struggling, what are the five or six things that you can do to take care of yourself? And then we have them write it in, the, in a three by five card. It goes in the back of their ID card and, and then they use that when they're feeling stressed out. We do that same thing with our guests. They write their own safety plan that they keep with them. So if we're cooking and in your safety plan is about you know knives and things like that, we could also address it with the fact that in your safety plan, and it always comes back to that treatment piece. Great, thank you, Michael. I will make your <clears throat> excuse me your email address available um, for the group yes. so that uh, they can ask any other questions. But um, I just love that you're not letting compliance regulations stop you from providing quality care. You know, and like that question that Shar asked about, you know, the knives and precaution checks and things like that. I love that you guys are just bringing on solutions and trying to find ways to, again, to, to honor the people that you're serving. So kudos to you guys. Uh, you know, send, send you. lots of, like, warm uh, fuzzies back from our group because I, I think you guys are doing awesome work. I truly appreciate that. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to talk about our programs. Absolutely. So let's go back here to what we were talking about as far as medical clearance. So I think we basically got through this slide here, <clears throat> but I want to spend a minute talking about um, the specifics of, of medical clearance and how it's actually a, a fairly like nebulous concept because there's not a standard definition that exists from one group to the next. And so... Um, there's an article that was in the Journal of Psychiatric uh, Nursing, I believe, um, in 2010 that said that there's really not a standard around medical clearance uh, as it pertains to psychiatry. Um, Dr. Leslie Zoon, who's actually a member of our work group, uh, was one of his studies was quoted in this paper, and I wanted to... Um, we wanted to try and just ask him a couple questions. Um, Dr. Zun, are you on the call with us right now? I sure am. Great. So uh, I wonder if you could talk for just a, a few minutes about, you know, where this nebulousness around medical clearance comes from and maybe give us some insight as to if there haven't been any standards that have developed more in the last five years or so or what some of those challenges are that come into play. So I, I think the issue that we've all been struggling with is doing routine labs versus labs that are clinically indicated. And there is some confusion between psychiatry and emergency medicine about what the best approach is. Um, if one looks at the literature, you'll see in the literature there's really no value in doing routine lab testing on psychiatric patients which would be no different than doing lab tests on somebody that comes in with an ankle sprain. Um, rather, we should be testing people based on their complaint, uh, meaning if they have um, a fever or, or pain somewhere, we should be evaluating for them rather than doing routine testing. So there are some patients that do need testing, and there are patients that are unlikely to need any testing. And when I say testing, I'm talking about the gamut of uh, CBC, electrolytes, urine drug screen, alcohol levels. There is, uh, the, the literature really does not support routine use. So rather, if the patient is, uh, has a physical complaint, has abnormal vital signs, has a new onset of psychiatric illness, uh, meaning they never had anything before, um, or the physical exam kind of indicates there's something else going on with the patient, then that's when tests are indicated. 
I want to spend a minute on um, alcohol and drug testing, and the 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 again no evidence to support the value in doing that as a routine on patients. The drug screen does not tell us they're clinically intoxicated. It does not make a diagnosis of substance use disorder. When we look at the DSM-5, there is nothing um, that talks about uh, positive screen or negative screen on a urine drug screen, same with alcohol. Um, all the drug screens tell us is that they've done it at some point in time in their past, not that they are doing it at this time. Um, the alcohol levels do, don't tell us if they're clinically intoxicated. They only tell us if they have alcohol in their system. So most of us believe that they're really, it's not helpful to do testing as a routine, but rather um, to do it when indicated. I'll give two quick examples. So you have a chronic schizophrenic stop taking their medicine and um, is acting you know, out of control consistent with their psychiatric illness. That person probably does not need lab testing. If we take, on the other hand, someone that's, say, in their mid-60s, never had a psychiatric illness before, comes in with manic behavior, then the question is, yeah, we probably do need to find out why all of a sudden they're having this manic behavior and they never had it before. So I hope that's a quick quick and dirty uh, overview, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions for a few minutes. Okay, great. So it sounds like what you're saying is that um, it's okay for providers to go in the direction of choosing specific instances or demographics that, that show up as to when they're going to make these tests. And we saw that in some of the responses from, from this month's survey that not everyone is doing it 100% of the time. And, and so it sounds like what you're saying is that the quote-unquote risk of not medically clearing everyone might be worth it if you're, um, you know, if you're filtering out almost like the sure thing kind of referrals and and putting people that have uh, a few more concerns or um, question marks uh, through that medical clearance process. Well, I, I guess one one other thing that I didn't talk about is um, the importance of um, doing a good history, a good physical exam. Uh, a mental status test, some kind of mental, mental status testing, and then decide. So you're, a good history and a good physical exam is going to give you a lot, a lot of valuable information that the lab testing um, is, is not going to give you. And really that should be the basis of how we determine, um, uh, how we determine what, to, you know, what test to get or not get. Mm-hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions that they want to pose? Okay. Um, it looks like not. Uh, Dr. Zinn, thanks you so much for your time. We appreciate you stepping in and kind of giving us some insight on, uh, on medical clearance. This has been uh, incredibly helpful. Uh, I'm glad to help anytime, and I'm glad to be on the uh, work group. Thank Great. you so much. Yep, thank you. I'm going to run there. back and... See patients now. <laughs> bye bye. Sounds good. Bye bye. <laughs> All right. Um, fresh off the emergency room floor, uh, Dr. Leslie uh, Zun. Zun. I'm uh, might be messing up the pronunciation, and I apologize if I am. But um, yeah, I thought that was really helpful and great to have that resource uh, here on our work group. So uh, moving on into the other um, uh, slide details. So. What do you expect to be included in medical clearance for individuals? Um, uh, Leslie talked about that a little bit, but, but most people agree vitals over 85%. Uh, a physical exam, 73%. Uh, a few of the comments that came in said that, that they typically do a urine drug screen on site, but they request it anyway. Um, a TB test. Um, labs are only required if uh, the patient needs a withdrawal bed. Um, and then the last one said, uh, we tell the ERs that we require no labs, but ER MDs typically order the usual panels. So 
This graph is a little bit more complex, uh, but it says how often are the following locations providing medical clearance to potential admissions? So from left to right, the blue means never, the green is rarely, the orange is occasionally, the gray is frequently, and the yellow is always. So uh, looking at this, it looks like um, emergency departments, which are listed on the bottom, are frequently or always, so between the two of those, it's about 70% of the time, are the locations that provide medical clearance for potential admissions. Um, but we also see psychiatric hospitals providing that clearance a little bit. Um, and so you can, you can kind of take this data in here a little bit, but uh, some of the comments that we saw are that some programs are moving to either not doing medical clearance all the time or doing some kind of basic clearance um, at their own site. I imagine that the programs that have co-located services, whether you're talking about uh, like maybe a psychiatric emergency room or a mobile crisis team um, in the same, you know, housed in the same building as your, your crisis uh, stabilization program, are going to be able to take some more steps, uh, some additional steps towards medical clearance. The next question was around handling complex medical needs. And the question was, how do you handle those referrals that have complex medical needs? So about uh, over half of the group said that they take individuals depending on the milieu and staffing patterns. 28% uh, said that they rarely accept individuals with complex needs. And then most of the other group, 17% said that we almost always accept individuals regardless of medical need complexity. A few of the comments that came in there said that they're accepted as long as individuals can tend to their ADLs, that we facilitate a more appropriate referral to a psychiatric hospital. Uh, the last person said our licensing board prohibits certain types of complex medical conditions, such as requiring a medical device to stabilize conditions. And I believe another person in that response said that there's not electrical outlets in some of the rooms, so they can't have medical equipment that it needs to be plugged in in order for a person to, you know, to sleep overnight or whatever. So if you replied yes to that question, the next question was what type of complex needs can you treat? Um, three quarters or more of the group said they could treat asthma, seizure disorders, or diabetes. Um, a little under half said they could do wound care, and only 13% said they could do a post-surgery rehab or a feeding tube. Uh, the next question was, what referrals have to be approved by a second level supervisor or manager? So about half of the medical need, uh, half of the people that responded said that, that medical needs need to be um, kind of go up the chain for, for uh, approval. Um, a few of the comments, one person said that a team approach uh, happens with every admission. So the nursing staff, the director, uh, the psychiatrist, they're all involved in these conversations. Um, another one said that the psychiatrist approves all referrals, so it doesn't have to just be like a unique case, um, which I don't know how big the program was that responded that way, but that could be an awfully high number of, um, of calls. If you've got a 16-bed program and you've got, you know, on average four admissions and three to four discharges every day, um, but, it, but it's certainly a way to, to control the front door. Uh, a few other people said individuals with a history of sexual impropriety, and one person also mentioned a history of suicide attempts as a reason that they would kind of step up a, a request uh, for admission to a director. Um, exclusionary criteria. So do you have anything that you won't allow people to come into your program for uh, with the legal system? So. About a third said criminal sexual conduct. So it sounds like some of the crisis programs in our work group are actually located near schools, and so they can't have they can't establish residence, uh, in, you know, close to a school. Um, about 20% 20, 20 said violent felony, and 10% said uh, if there's a current warrant out for the for an arrest. So. You can see some of the comments there on the left side. Uh, one was client must sign release to parole officer or we won't admit them. Um, another person said uh, only excluded if violence or a CSC occurred within the past month. Uh, 
Uh, more on legal system involvement. What do you do if a client has an outstanding uh, warrant? And a lot of people said that they do not communicate with law enforcement about the client unless they present the warrant at the program. Um, a few of those programs the 8% said that they don't accept people with a warrant and 4% said that they inform law enforcement. Um, a few of the, the specific responses, um, one, one program said that they don't confirm or deny the, the presence of a client if, a, if the police show up at the door. But they will approach the, um, the client and say the police are asking to meet with you at the door, but then they give them the choice as to whether or not they want to, to, um, to go to the door or not. Uh, while then another participant said we cooperate fully and do not hinder but do not inform without consent so that's that's similar um, and a few others said that that law enforcement are included on the release of information um, at the time of intake and some programs said we, we don't a lot of times we don't know that some that there's a warrant out for someone's arrest until the until the police come to the door so it's not necessarily been forthcoming when you do that legal uh, section on the psychosocial assessment. All right, a couple more slides here. Uh, the next one is about creating safety plans. So how do you cre create safety plans around unusual and perver pervasive behaviors? So we talked about things like pica, cutting, self-harm, anything that's kind of maybe going to fall outside the traditional um, behaviors or um, actions that someone in your program would, would do. So 57% said other, right, which is great because what does other mean? We have a couple of examples on the, on the left side there, but um, a little under half wrote restrictive behavior plans. About a third said that they'll increase staffing. Uh, a few of the comments were restricting access to items and increasing safety checks. Uh, safety planning informing uh, through zero suicide initiatives. Um, I don't know if we've asked that question specifically, but we might put it on a future survey uh, about how many organizations um, uh, are currently involved in zero suicide initiatives um, in our work group. I think that would be interesting to, to know. Um, one program said that clients are either stepped up to the psych hospital or they're discharged from the program if they can't. Um, you know, if, if their uh, presence in the program uh, affects the safety of others or the, um, uh, you know, they're not able to keep themselves safe, um, constantly making the milieu a challenge. And then increasing safety checks. Um, I believe, I don't know if it's on, okay, it's on this slide now. Okay, so we've got some great comments in here that also came in, just more details about managing admissions. So, one person said we're able to transfer clients between our three locations if the milieu is directly related to conflicts. So for those of you that manage more than one crisis program, you might be able to transfer them right to, to a different location. Or maybe if uh, a neighboring crisis provider in a different county has space, maybe you can talk to them about getting them the help that they need. Um, I know that sometimes situations have come up where like a married couple has been referred to a crisis program. Um, which I guess it kind of depends on the married couple, right? Um, but uh, so, something to think about, you know, what are the instances as far as people being related to each other or like an ex-boyfriend, and ex-girlfriend? Like what are the instances in which you would make some of these accommodations? Now this is awesome. And I think that this came from Jamie, um, who's uh, Jamie Webster um, at one of the programs in Colorado, she said, we keep a record of denials and review them monthly with leadership to see patterns where more education and training may be needed for the unit. After a year, we've seen a major decrease in denials and a 99% drop in denials that we should have accepted. Um, Jamie, is are you on the phone right now? I know that you were traveling during this, this call today, but um, are you with us right now? And if you're on the phone, if you press star six, that should unmute you. So we will all briefly wait here in an awkward silence to see if Jamie is on the phone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, Jamie. Awesome. <laughs> I did star six, but it muted me rather than unmute. So. Oopsies. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, can you tell us? Can you tell us about kind of where this initiative came came from, and you know, like how it's been so successful? 
Yeah, uh, we developed this process as we were really trying to find a way to track patterns and denials while still granting our admissions coordinators and nurses a bit of autonomy and uh, helping them to feel supported in their decisions. So we have narrowed down the categories that are acceptable for uh, consumers to be denied. We track it all in a spreadsheet. Um, if it's a medical or if it is a clinical denial, they have to give a reason. And then once a month, we uh, look through all of those. We stat the answers. Um, and then in our monthly meetings with our director um, and our medical director, uh, we really look at patterns. And then we come back to staff with patterns and say, hey, guys, you know, it looks like we had a lot of denials around this specific issue. Let's do some education around it. Let's see if we need to beef up safety on the unit. What do we need to do to decrease that? So we've been doing that for a year, and our um, numbers have gotten a lot better. We've also been able to institute things like now we partner with Centura to do uh, primary care consults for consumers that otherwise would have been denied for medical issues. Um, so that's been really helpful. That's awesome. Thank you, Jamie. Thanks for that insight. I hope that um, some other programs that uh, are struggling with, you know, similar admission denial issues can um, can learn from that. So thank you for piping in. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just a couple more uh, quotes here. So one program said, focusing on frequent utilizers to our walk-in services, as these individuals also frequent jails and hospital EDs and shelter systems. So kind of taking a, a social determinants of health approach and looking at what those root causes are. Like, why are people uh, you know, using these services so much, and what other services are they using? Um, uh, one, another person said we've been able to move people to other parts of our building with staff support. So maybe if you've got like a 10 bed or a 12 or a 16 bed program, um, maybe you move them into an area where either people are more like them or um, they're not able to kind of um, like, per, uh, I don't know, just um, bother is not the right word, but just like inflict any type of like um, emotional harm or anything like that. So maybe matching people up uh, based on gender. Um, if there's language barriers, maybe there's some staff who, you know, um, like speak a second language and can help them out more if they're, if they're closer to them, those kinds of things. And this was one of my favorite um, quotes from our group. And it says, um, whoopsies, it says our personal trauma informed approach results in clients uh, respecting the crisis program e and the rules even when they're extremely sick. So we assist in getting them to the appropriate level of care and that it's unethical for us to treat someone beyond our scope of practice. And that's, I think that's a really interesting point that um, what, what we're commissioned to do as crisis programs can, um, can vary from one community to the next. Um, but there is an ethical issue at some point when you're being asked to do more than you're capable of doing. And so what are the implications there? You know, what, what is the, how does the funding need to change? How does the staffing need to change? You know, what needs to take place in order to be able to, to ad accurate, adequately and consistently uh, take care of individuals with some of these needs? And what I've also heard from crisis programs in the last five or 10 years is that um, the acuity is going up you know, and the comorbid medical conditions and the co-occurring substance use disorders are going up. So it's harder to do this work than it was five or 10 years ago. And if your length of stay is shortened, then that also makes it harder because then you're doing more admissions every every year or every week, right? So a couple last slides here before we finish up. Um, if you have not filled in surveys, um, Claudia's gonna be sending the, the, the last request for those out by the end of the month. Um, and we just ask you to complete those surveys within 30 days. Um, remember, if you complete 80% or more of the surveys that we've asked you for, we will include you in um, the contributor list uh, in the toolkit. And you'll also have, get early access to the toolkit as well. Um, we are taking a database. We're building a database of crisis services across the country. I mentioned that at the start of the call. Um, if you've received an email from us about the services, if you could just verify whether that list is accurate or not based on what you know, and just tell us maybe what you don't know as well. Like, hey, I know about crisis res, and I know about 23-hour uh, programs, but I don't know about mobile crisis. Um, that'll just go a long way towards us being able to kind of do this mapping of the crisis genome here. 
Uh, lastly, our next call is Friday, November 17th at 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific. I just sent that invite out yesterday, so if you didn't receive that, please let me know. Uh, we'll be talking about technology and crisis programs. Uh, if you want to send an email to the listserv, you can just send it straight there. You don't have to email me first. It just goes to Crisis Residential Network at tbdsolutions.com. Uh, the meeting slides are up on our website, uh, as well as a bunch of other resources that you can feel free to check out. So that's it for the call today. Thanks for everyone that participated. Thank you to Michael for uh, your insights on your program. Thank you to Dr. Zun um, and to um, everyone that was on the call today. We really appreciate it, and we will do it again next month. Have a good day.